Good evening. It's really a privilege for me to be here. Um, when they said that I'd be sharing a Christmas message, do you know how broad that is? To put the Christmas message in 30 minutes or less? <laughs> Thanks for the message you gave the children. I too am actually going to speak to two groups of people. One group I'd like to encourage by just reminding you of what you already know those of you that are born again. The other group of you that may not be born again, I would like to explain to you why we believe. When I thought about a title for the message, I thought, okay, so how do we prepare for Christmas? I mean, Christmas is a strange word. I looked up the definitions in the dictionary and they talk about it being a religious holiday and all kinds of things. But the word Christ means anointed one, and mass is what the Catholics gave it for his death. So we are talking about the anointed one and his death. Didn't know that till yesterday. Anyway, how do we prepare for Christmas? Some people put up lights. But why? Well, because it says Jesus is the light of the world. Some people spend a lot of time looking for the right gift for family and friends. Yet Jesus is the perfect gift. The wise men, and they came and they brought gifts. Some people, they play music at Christmas. And others would say, well, you know, I really like certain kinds of music. We have, we have rock music, we have country and western music, and they all try this time of year to tie something in that would make you as a Christian listen to their music. Anything. They, they just, they'll make some kind of announcement they're going to play some kind of Christmas music. It didn't any more Christmas than flying. But why do, they, why do we have Christmas and Christmas carols? More than likely it's because of what the angels came in their announcement. Because it says they were praising God. And saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth, goodwill toward men. That's, a, that's a, like the original Christmas carol. Some have parties with lots of good food. Special cookies, special cakes made just for the season and for that time of year. But it's really about family and relationships when it comes to these parties. Now, good things turn into traditions or customs, whichever you prefer. And they lose their intended value. So tonight, let's just back up for a few minutes and see what these traditions, what the intended value is behind the stories. <clears throat> how did God, or how does God, prepare us for Christmas? God's plan of redemption started before the beginning of the world. And yet, we read in Genesis 3, I'm going to read verses 14 and 15. It's the curse of Satan. Because you have done this, cursed are you among more than all the cattle and more than the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. That is our first glimpse into what Christmas is actually going to be about. Then we have another one, and, and it's like Cain and Abel. The prophecies are incredible. When you actually see from the New Testament like our brother said, you kind of see the shadows. I tell people, I said, if you look at the shadows in the Old Testament and you kind of run out of, of, of like the shadow, it's because you're going the wrong way. Turn around. The shadow, you have, you have to bump into the real thing. Okay, so with Cain and Abel, they brought their sacrifices. One was accepted, one wasn't. I'm going to make it a really short, easy something to remember, and that is Cain brought God what he wanted God to have. Abel brought what God wanted. 
Now, if you bring God what he wants, you'll be accepted because what he wants is you. But if you try any other way, and this is the first we know of where they tried a different way. It didn't work for Cain, and it won't work for you or me. So how else did God prepare us? Well, if we keep, keep looking, we'll find out that there's some things that we can see in the stories that are really, really important, and I'm positive, coming from my background and knowing your background, that you have all been down these roads. In Genesis 6 through 9 is the story of Noah. Listen to what God says about Noah. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. That's all would have had to have been said. He was righteous. He was blameless in his time. And what's the last one? And he walked with God. What's God looking for? We have prophecies like Isaiah 7, 14, where it talks about a virgin bear, uh, uh, bearing a son. And in chapter 30, 53, we have the story of like Jesus' life. In Jeremiah 23, there's another one that, now I, I'm going to end with the story about the shepherds, but till we get there, you have to remember that most of the people back then could not read. So they had to either have somebody read to them or tell them the stories. So if you were, it doesn't matter who you were, you, you didn't have a scroll because they were way too expensive, too valuable. They, they were kept at the, in the synagogue or at the temple. But if you had the privilege of hearing, these are some of the things that God would have said. Now, I'm going to skip the first part of chapter 23 and start with ver verse 4. The first part is telling them that they were not telling the people the truth. Now, this is what it says, in, starting with verse 4, chapter 23 of Jeremiah. I shall also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor be terrified, nor will they be mis... Be mis excuse me nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land. In the days of Judah, excuse me, in his days Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell in security. And this is his name by which he will be called the Lord our righteousness. What kind of words are we hearing when we hear that? Are we just reading a story about a prophecy in the Old Testament? Or since we have the New Testament, are we thinking about what it's actually telling us? As we walk through these stories, we find God, through the prophets, doing two things. He's drawing the people back to himself, but he's also pointing them to the Messiah. And when that happens the people will have hope. Hopelessness is the devil's playground. So when people are hopeless, they are bombarded by all kinds of things and they, they don't have anything to look forward to. Hope and comfort are two things that the prophets did. I'm just going to tell you these three uh, chapters, Isaiah 35, Isaiah 40, Isaiah 61. They all give us a little bit of the same message but in Isaiah 40, excuse me, I have to get it quick. In Isaiah 40, there's these wonderful words. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says the Lord God. Speak kindly to Jerusalem. Call out to her that her warfare has ended, that her iniquity has been removed, and she has received the Lord's, that she has received of the Lord's hand, double for her sins. A voice calling, clear the way for the Lord. In the wilderness, make smooth in the desert a highway for our God. Let every valley be lifted up, every mountain and hill be made low, and let the rough ground become plain, and the rugged terrain, and, and the rugged terrain a broad valley. Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and, and all flesh will see it together. 
for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. This message of comfort, it came 70 years. Now, I'll say it back. I almost said it backwards. When this came, they were in exile, and they would not be out of exile for 70 years. But it's a double prophecy. It's a prophecy about Jesus, too. It's a prophecy about John the Baptist. And that doesn't happen for 700 more years. Tell me, can you keep hope? Can you keep faith? Can you keep believing for 70 years? How about 700? Can you teach your children and teach your children so they teach their children so that it lasts for 700 years? I hope so. Because it's been 2,000 since Jesus came the first time. And he's coming again. Can you keep hope and comfort and faith and blessing? Can you keep it alive? Listen, there's, there's one more that, that we have to do. And that is, I mean, like I said, there's no possible way to do this in 30 minutes. But there's one that many people miss. Mark read... John 3, which included John 3, 16. I'm going to read you Malachi 3. And Malachi 3, 16 is a really special verse. Actually, you should, whenever you think of John 3, 16, you ought to flip back and read Malachi 3, 16. This is what it says. Your words have been arrogant against me, says the Lord. You say, but you say, what have we spoken against thee? You have said, it is vain to serve the Lord, and what profit is it that we keep his charge, and that we have walked in mourning before the Lord of hosts? So now we call the arrogant blessed. Not only are the doers of wickedness built up, but they, are also test, but they also test God and escape. That's what they said. But listen to this. This is 3.16. Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. Listen, it says that when they were talking about God in a good way, it got God's attention. It says he listened and he heard it, but it gets better. It says, the Lord gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance is written before him, capitalized, for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. How do we talk about God? By talking about the circumstances we're in. Do we grumble and complain? One of the words that follow the Jewish people from the very beginning is grumbling. We're not too far behind them. But there's more. Verse 17. And they will be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession and I will spare them like a man spares his own son who serves him so you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him who are we as a people how do we prepare for Christmas do we prepare for Christmas by doing what everybody else does or do we prepare for Christmas by repenting and by being thankful by blessing God, that, that word bless means to speak well of, to bless God and to bless each other. Okay, that's to bring us up to the Christmas story. When I think of the Christmas story, and I think of how God prepared a people, because it actually says this, and I'm because of time, I'm just going to talk through this. In... Luke 1, we have several stories. The first story is the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, their names have a a wonderful meaning. Zechariah means God remembers. Elizabeth means his promises. And John means of grace. So in one family, just their names give us the good news of the gospel story. You can relate that back to what it says about Noah. Noah. And it says, and God remembered Noah. That's good news, right? It is if you're stuck in a boat. Okay, listen. 
those two people raised a son. And they probably were not living after he was 15 or 16 years old. Because these two godly people really could hardly believe what was happening to them. They had prayed and prayed and nothing happened. Now it was happening and it seemed like it was too late, too much, and they were too old. But they were still willing. They were still willing. How about you and me? How willing are we? How willing are we to accept God's message and be obedient and put it into practice no matter what anybody says? Mary, too. Mary, Mary has this wonderful little phrase that says, Be it unto me, your bondservant. Be it unto me. In other words, you said it, I questioned it. There's nothing wrong with questioning what God says because he'll give you an answer if you look. And when the angel answered her and said exactly what was going to happen, she said, okay, I'm willing. You see, Elizabeth is too old to have a baby, and she's having a baby. Mary is too young, and she's not married, and she's going to have a baby. That's the collision of the Old and the New Testament. It's a time when the things that happened in the Old Testament, Elizabeth could say, well, yes, this happened to... Rebecca, this happened to Sarah. What's Mary got to go by? The angel's word. That's what she's got to go by. We have Joseph. It says that Joseph, this is Matthew 1, 24, and Joseph awoke from his, his sleep, did as the angel commanded him, and took Mary to be his wife and kept her as a virgin till she gave birth to a son. And called him Jesus. Interesting thoughts about Joseph. Joseph in the Old Testament, Joseph in the New Testament. They're, both of them had fathers named Jacob. Both of them had amazing maturity. Both of them had visions from God. Both of them were in Egypt. One is a type of Christ, the other a stepfather of Jesus. What did all these people have in common? We know from Hebrews 11:4 that Abel was a righteous man. Genesis 6:9 Noah was a righteous man and blameless in his time. Genesis 12:4 and Abraham went as the Lord had spoken to him. Luke 1:6 Zechariah and Elizabeth were both righteous before the Lord walking blamelessly in his commandments and require and the requirements of the Lord. Matthew 1:19 Joseph was a righteous man. Luke 1:28 to 38 Mary found favor. That word favor means grace. That's a very special word. There's a lot of people today talking about wanting to find favor with God. If you find the grace of God, you happen to have bumped in to Jesus. They're all trying to help us to prepare for Christmas. Some of them show us that society was really against them. <laughs> All of them believed and acted on God's word. Some show us that religion was even against them. All of them show us that God was with them. The question always is, is God with us? Because if somebody answers and says yes, I'll say either are you sure or tell me how. Because the way I know is if you have hope, if you know how to bless, if you're kind and patient and caring, that's how I know that you know. Okay, the last part. The last part of this is about the shepherds. Now, we heard a little bit about the shepherds, but I want to be able to kind of put these things together so that it makes sense. Because... Sometimes in, in English it'll say good news. Sometimes it says the gospel. Listen to this. And in the same region there were shepherds staying out in the fields, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly appeared to them. And, they, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. And they were terribly frightened. The, if in the original, the, the terribly frightened is way worse than just terribly frightened. These guys thought they were going to die. 
I mean, how, how, do you, how do you get this big announcement showing up from heaven and you're a nobody? Now, just a side note, when the children of Israel went to Egypt, Joseph told his brothers to tell Pharaoh that they were the keepers of herds, which means like cattle and sheep. Because it says that the, the Egyptians loathed the people that did that. In other words, they hated them. So Joseph wanted to make sure to make a difference between God's people and the Egyptians. Now get this. These people, the shepherds, were taking care of the sheep. And the high ups of both religion and society thought they were the local outcasts. They had returned to the thinking of Egypt just before Jesus got there. This is what the angel said. Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news. That's the same as the word gospel of a great joy, which shall be to all people. That's a shocking statement because Jesus came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, right? Isn't that what the Bible says? Okay, so even at the beginning, Jesus started with the shepherds because they knew that they wouldn't be included unless the announcement was to them and for them. Listen to this. For today in the city of David, there was born, there has been born to, guess what? You, all people, and now the message is for you, a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Why is this good news? Because we are all born sinful. We all need a Savior. But that's kind of generic when we say all. But what happens when the focus goes like this and it says, it's for you? That means it's for me too. <clears throat> and this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in claws, lying in a manger, and suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, if the first angel scared them to death, what about that whole multitude? We don't know how many a multitude is, but it's a bunch. And guess what they're doing? Praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace among men and to, with whom he is pleased. And it came about when the angel, angels had gone away, from then to heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, let us go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They recognized where the message came from. They wanted to see the truth behind the message. That's what the angel said, right? Like Abraham, God told him, and it says, so he went. The angels told them, so they went. Uh, and they came in, came in haste and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in a manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which has been told them about the child. Okay, it's for all people. Just so nobody misses it, it's for you. And like to understand whether you get the message or not, what did the shepherds do? Now remember, they're the nobodies in town. They smell like sheep. What does it say? And see this thing which the Lord made known to us. And they came in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe as he lay in the manger. And when they had seen this, they made known the statement which they had been told them about this child. What did they do? Did they just go back to their sheep? You ever notice on your GPS, it'll tell you the, the most direct way, and then it, got, it has, well, this is 14 minutes faster, and this is an hour, I mean slower, and this is an hour slower. Their GPS took them the hour slower. They went everywhere telling everybody what had happened to them on the mountain, and they would have said, it's for all people, and it's for you because it's for us, and if we're the nobodies, it's got to be for you. And all who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. 
Don't you want them to be a, a little bit like Philip, those people, and say, J just come and see. You know, if you can't quite get it, just come and see. And all those who heard it wondered at the things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary treasured all these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds went back, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen, just as they had been told. You know what the answer to that is? It's true. If you're sitting here tonight and you are just a part of everything that's going on, I want to tell you just one thing about John the Baptist. John the Baptist probably memorized the entire Old Testament. So no matter where he started preaching, it, 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 you couldn't fool him. The, his audience, when those that came from the Pharisees, they were the same. They memorized everything. They memorized all the books of the Bible, I mean, the Old Testament. Do you know the difference between these two? John the Baptist and the Pharisees. It can be the difference between these two groups of people I'm talking to tonight. The Pharisees knew what the Bible said. They knew the stories. John the Baptist knew the God of the stories. Thank you.